All right, so module six, um, a simple MIPS processor. We are starting building the data path for a MIPS processor here. We talked about the building blocks like register files, instruction memory, data memory, and so on. And we talked about the multiplexers and the path that need to be selected based on different instructions and the multiplexers uh, helping us to choose the path based on the control unit that we have. Uh, then we start building the data path. We mentioned that there are some principles in MIPS processor that allows us to uh, reuse some of the blocks and simplify the architecture a little bit. For example, we mentioned that every instruction in MIPS except for jump uh, use ALU after the register, so it kind of gives us some idea about how it works, and it makes the architecture a little bit simpler. A lot of processors follow the same kind of simplicity in their architectures because they want to they want it to be predictable and simpler to design. Uh, we started with the first step, which was fetch and decoding, and we built from there. We had the uh, we covered the R type instructions and how they work, the blocks that are involved in R type instructions. And same story for load and store. We talked about the load and store instructions. So we continued building the data path. We started from the decoding phase and now we built the blocks that we needed for other instructions. And this is where we stopped. So I'm going to quickly go over it one more time because that was at the end of the session. Class. And it's an important uh, part of this computer system, just a branch. We mentioned that, I'm going to quickly go over it. We mentioned that branches use a relative addressing. So the value that we have in the offset part of the machine code for a branch is pointing to how many instructions I just need to move forward or backward. And it's not an absolute address, addressing method that we use in jump. And the way it worked, we remember that it was a simple thing, we get the 16 bit because this relative number should be multiplied by four because of the byte addressable and the word thing that we covered many times in the class. So it's multiplied by four or shifted left twice. And then we sign extend it to get a 16 bit, 32 bit value. The reason we do it is because of the ALU. The ALU, ALU is a 32-bit ALU. So if you want to find the target address, you have to get the offset, multiply that by, by four, and add it with PC plus four, okay? The PC plus four is a, PC is a 32-bit register. PC plus four is gonna be 32-bit. ALU is 32-bit, so we have to sign extend it to go from 18 bits, in this case, to 32 bits, or we do the sign extension first and then shift it. So we go from 16 to 32 and then shift it. Uh, this is actually what is really happening in the process. So we calculate the uh, offset multiplied by 4 and add it to PC plus 4. Now we both we have both of the options. So we based on branch, if you remember how branch works, if the condition is met, you branch to the label. If it is not met, you simply go to the next instruction. The next instruction is PC plus 4, and the target address is calculated already. Uh, so we have both of these calculated every time. This was the kind of overhead dimension that we have in the processor. We calculate both of them every time. And we have a multiplexer that chooses where we want to go next. Okay, so this chooses between PC plus 4 and the branch target address. So we mentioned that we are going to use uh, ALU for branches to compare two registers. And the way we do it is through a subtraction. So if you have a BE, BEQ, which is branch equal, BEQ T0 and T1, we actually subtract T0 and T1. And if the result is zero, it means that they're equal. If it's not zero, it means that they're not equal. Okay. So based on this information of them being zero, the result of subtraction being zero or not zero, we can choose the path. That multiplexer that we talked about here is going to use this zero flag to choose between these two different paths. Okay. 
So the ALU operation that we have here is subtraction for branch. This is the part that I mentioned that you know when we were explaining this, we do both of them at the same time, so you don't know which one happens first. The processor actually would go from 16 bit to 32 bit always, and then we shift it left twice or multiply by four. It's the same thing. Okay. And the zero flag is what we use to choose the path. How do we generate the zero flags through a NOR gate? So the output of the subtraction, or the better way is saying that the output of the ALU. All the bits in the output of the ALU are connected to this NOR gate. And if all of them are zero, the output will be zero. If only one of them is not zero, the output, sorry, if all of them is zero, the output will be one. If even one of these signals, these bits, is one, the output will be zero. And that means that they are, if one of the bits is not zero, it's enough for the output to not be equal to zero, right? And that's enough. So this NOR gate that is connected to the output of the ALU is what generates the zero flag, okay? That's what we use to choose between different paths of the branch. Now, how a branch works, we have a subtraction, we subtract two registers, we get the zero flag, and then we have the rest here. The calculates the address, and the multiplexer is going to be chosen based on that zero flag. If it's zero, we're going to choose the PC plus four. If it's one, we go to the branch target address. Okay? So now putting everything together, we mentioned that we have something like this, which is doing the this part is what we just explained about the uh, branch. Okay. So this is the part that we added to the data path that we had before. And then we have the PC source. Okay, PC source is selected between PC plus four and the app on the target apps. Now PC source, if it is equal to zero, branch not taken is equal to branch one, branch is taken. Um, I think I have to go back because this block doesn't show it. Or does it? Yeah. So this is what we saw in the beginning. This is the PC plus source and we at the very end of the class I mentioned that you know we don't really have a PC source at coming out of the control unit. The control unit has a branch signal and if it's a branch that is going to be set to 1, then there we use an AND gate to get the branch signal coming out of the control unit and AND it with the 0 signal. And if the output is 1, then the branch is taken. This is designed to not take the branch every time the output of the AOU is 0, because there might be cases that we are actually using subtraction and the result of the subtraction is 0 or if you're adding two numbers and the result of the add is zero, and this is not really a branch instruction, we don't want to take the branch, we don't want to go to the target address, so this is the way we fix that problem. We have a zero flag, we end the zero flag with the control signal that's called branch. Okay? Now, Now let's take it from here. All right, so now we know different plugs in the processor, and now we, our plan is to build the MIPS processor, a very simple data path for the MIPS processor. One of the most important things that you need to know about this data path is how ALU works. Okay, so we have uh, we support these ALU operations in this simple data path, as we mentioned, the simple architecture. We support AND, OR, ADD, SUBTRACT, SET LESS THAN, NOR. Okay? So right here, I give you a hint. There might be one of the questions I can ask you is about an instruction that doesn't exist in this instruction set architecture. So we cover these simple instructions in the class. And then I ask you, what if I want to do AND immediate as well? What should, 
what should I change in the architecture? Okay, so you have to understand this very well, but also you have to, um, as a practice, try to design some questions for yourself and see how you add more instructions to this uh, data path and what needs to be added to the data path if I want to add these instructions. Okay, but in this class, we're going to cover these simple instructions. So the ALU control line has four bits, and based on what these four bits are, we activate the part of the ALU that is responsible for this function. Okay, so if, for example, the ALU control line is 0000, zero, zero, zero we activate a 32 bit AND gate. So we have 32 ANDs here, and it does a bitwise AND. Okay. We have OR gates, add, subtraction, set less than, and more. Okay. So now, how do we use ALU? For load war and store war instructions, we use ALU to calculate the target, uh, the memory address, and for that we use an addition. Okay, so what it means is that every time that I have a load war and a store war, the ALU operation is going to be 0010. Okay, so activate 0010 to add the offset with the base address. If I have an R-type instruction, R-type instructions, these guys are all R-type instructions, so they have different ALE signals. So depending on what kind of instruction you want to execute, you have to send this control lines to the ALU. And for branch equal, we have subtraction. Okay, so whenever we have a branch equal instruction, the ALU operation signal should be 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay. So this is the control uh, signal, control lines. But how does it really work? We have two-step uh, signal generation, right? We have the input of the function field, and then we have the ALU OP. So ALU operation has two bits. And then we have six bits coming from the function field of the machine code. Okay. Um, the output is going to be the four bit that is connected to the ALU itself. Now we know how these four bits should be set based on this slide to get those instructions. Now we want to see how we generate these four bits based on this information. Okay, the six bit is coming from the machine code. We know that <coughs> on the function field. And then we have the ALU OP coming from the control unit. So now, control unit doesn't need to generate four signals, it just needs to generate two signals, okay? We just have two lines. With two lines we can have, we can cover the entire operation that they want to do in the processor. Uh, so this is how we save a few lines, because the function field already exists there. Okay? So now, if you look at this table here, we have a two-bit control field coming out of the control unit in the processor. If the ALU OP is 0, 0, we have a load board or store board instruction. Okay, so when it comes here, it's a load board and a store board. Then we ignore the function field. This X that we see is no, we don't care. Okay, so every time that we don't care about the signal, we put X. So we don't care about the function field when it's ALU OP is 0, 0. We generate the output 0, 0, 0010. 0. What does 0, 0, 0010 0 do? Addition. Every time that we have load word and store word, we want to add the base address with the offset. So we just check the LED OP. We don't care about the function field. And we don't actually have a function field, right? If you have a load word and a store word, it's an I type instruction. So I type instruction don't even have a function field. That's why we ignore them, because the six bit is going to be part of the offset not the function field. Branch equal, same story. Branch equal, LUOP is going to be 0, 1. This is going to be generated by the control unit. The operation is going to be 0, the ALU control input is going to be 0, 1, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1, 0 is a subtraction, which is exactly what we need. And we ignore the function field. Okay. So now if the ALUOP is 1, 0, it means that it's an R-type instruction. Then we check the function field and generate the ALU control input based on the function field. Okay? So again, yeah, 
gives us these are the signals coming from the ALU OP from the control unit based on these two levels, ALU OP and the function field, we generate the four bit ALU control input and that controls the functionality of the ALU. Does that make sense? Okay. So now we want to build the data path. This is where if I jump to this block, and this is usually what a lot of people do when they teach the course, they start from this module. Okay. If I start with this module and you don't have a clear idea about decoding, we are literally going over, right? Now you have a clear idea about how we do machine coding, how, what, how does encoding work, how does decoding work, right? Now we want to build the data path from this machine code that we see here. Okay, so we can make some major observation that helps us to create a simpler data path between, based on this, these different machine codes that we can have in the next process. The first observation is that the opcode field is always in bits 31 to 26. No matter what type of instruction we have, the opcode field is here. Okay. We'll see how, how we're going to use it. The next thing is that the two registers that we want to read are always in bits 25 to 21 and bits 20 to 16. So this you should be a little bit more careful. Sometimes RT is not the register that we want to read. Okay, that's a different statement. But if we want to read two registers, if we want to read two registers, they are always in bits, the address for those registers are always a source in bits 25 to 21 and 20 to 16. There are some cases that we don't want to read two registers. We deal with that in another way, okay? But this is always a fact. The two registers, the address for two registers are there. Here, RS and RT are the addresses that we want to read to access those two registers. The base register for load or on a store board, which is RS, is always in bits 25 and 20 to 21. Okay. The 16 bit offset for BQ, load board, store board, add immediate, sub immediate, these are instructions that we're not covering now, but all of those instructions use the offset field, the constant field, and that is always bit 0 to 15 of the machine code. Okay. Now, the destination register, though, can be in two different places. The destination register can either be in bits 20 to 16, for load and store, or bits 15 and 11 for R-type instructions. Okay, so the destination register can come from two different parts of the machine code. We already know that for cases like this, that we can potentially have two different paths. What do we use to fix that problem? Every time that we have two inputs, or more than one input, and just one output, so we have multiple paths, and we want to select an output path from them. What do we use here? What's the problem? <coughs> it's a multiplexer. So right here, we need a multiplexer to select the destination register based on the instruction. So we are saying that we are adding another control signal to the processor. Okay. So now let's go back to this data path that we had. This is the data path that we know by now. The only thing that is missing here is that the zero flag is connected to an AND gate and there's a branch here going to PC source, okay? We're missing something else here too. So this is the data path. You tell me how it works. So we have instruction memory, instructions coming from the instruction memory. Based on the information that we set, we, we can send some of the bits to read register one because we know that always, this is, this is the second point here, because 
the registers that we want to read are always in bits 25 to 21 and 20 to 16, what we can do here, we can always send the bit 25 to 21 here and 20 to 16 here. That will show up, no matter what. Even if we don't want to read two registers, this is another overhead. Even if our instruction doesn't need to read two registers, we send the addresses there just in case. The control signals define whether we're going to use that or not. <coughs> If those addresses, those bits in the machine code are already sent to the input of the read register 1 and read register 2. Okay. Now we have the write register input. So this write register is going to define what is the address of the register that we want to write the output of the ALU or the output of the memory to. Okay. So this is the register, so the address for the register. This is the part that we said there might be some complications because this address is not always coming from a specific part of the machine code. Depending on the instruction, it can either come from bits 20 to 16 or bits 15 to 11. If it's a load board, the input of the write register is going to be bits 20 to 16. If it's, a store, if it's the R type instruction, input is going to come from bits 15 to 11. So what it means is that here is where I need a multiplexer. When I want to define the address of the register that I want to write to, I need a multiplexer choosing between different bits. Those bits are bits 20 to 16 or 15 to 11 depending on the instruction. Okay, the other thing that we are missing here is the ALU control block. Okay, this ALU control block we mentioned that it's also coming from somewhere else. We had a 6-bit function field, we have a 2-bit ALU OP, we are not showing this in this data. Okay, so now let's see how the data path looks like if we include those. So this is the data path that includes everything that we just mentioned. There is a multiplexer here that chooses between bits 20 to 16 and bits from 15 to 11. Okay. This is the multiplexer that we just talked about. And this is the ALU control unit. So the input of the ALU control unit is the function field. The function field has bit zero to five of the instruction, right? We know that from the decoding, for the encoding module. This is going to the ALU control unit and the ALU OP are the signals that we just covered, zero, 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 one, one, zero. And it chooses different instructions, okay? So now, you can see that the bits 21 to 25 of the instruction is sent to the read register. Bits 16 to 20 is sent to the read register. Anyways, and then we are gonna, this is another thing that you have to pay attention to. We will read these two registers anyways. No matter what, even if we're not gonna use them, we are gonna read the contents of these addresses. They come here, we might not use it, but we do read it. Okay. This is the cost of having a general purpose processor. Okay. Then we have, then for the write registers, we have two options. We either have bits 20 to 16 or 15 to 11 going to the multiplexer. This is another thing that I mentioned. The bits 0 to 15 is always the offset. So it doesn't matter what instruction we want to run. We do the sign extension. We do shift it by left twice. And we do calculate the branch target address. Even if we don't want to use it, we do it every time. Branch target address is calculated in the processor every time, no matter what. Then through this multiplexer, we decide whether we want to use that or we don't want to use it. Okay? This is the cost of having the general purpose processor. Okay? So bits 15, 0 to 15 are coming here anyways, and then we get bits 0 to 5 from this part, going to ALU control input, ALU OP, ALU operation, and so on. Okay, so what do we see here in terms of the signals? This is what we just added. So, okay. so these are all the signals that we are seeing here. Register write, register destination, ALU source, some of these we already talked about. PC source, memory write, memory mem This is something that we also talked about before. If you don't remember it, I'm gonna mention it one more time. This mem to register is the multiplexer that's going to choose what 
where the content of the register that we want to write to is coming from. Is if it's coming from memory, it's a load word instruction, we go this path. If it's an R type instruction, we get the output of the ALU, so we choose a zero for the multiplexer, and then we write this back to the right data. Okay. So now let's see how these signals work. Okay. What do we have here? We have register destination. Let's just start from the first one. I'll take it from you. Can you see it? So register destination, if it's zero, it means that the right register is coming from RT, which is bits 20 to 16. If it's one, it means that the right register address is coming from RD, which is the bits 15 to 11. Register right is the next signal. Register right, if it's zero, we are not writing anything to the register file. Don't do anything. Okay. Register read, if it's, sorry, if, it's, if it's one, then we write something to the register. We do want to write something to the register file. As you can see, we don't have a register read here. We always read the register file anyways. Okay, so there's no signal to control the register read. ALU source is defining the second output, the second input of the ALU. If it is zero, the second input of the ALU is coming from the register file. If it's one, the second input of the ALU is coming from the sign extended 16 bit. So the 16 bit com comes here, the sign extended is connected to the multiplexer. So if it's one, this path is chosen. If it's zero, this path is chosen. It's about the second input of the ALU. PC source, if it's zero, we simply have choose PC plus four, so we go to the next instruction. If it is one, we choose the branch target. This PC source is also a combination of two signals, we know that. Memory read, when it's zero, we're not reading anything from the memory. When it's one, we do actually want to read the content of the memory address and send it back to the register file at some point. Okay. Memory write. If it's zero, we don't want to do anything. If it's one, we do actually want to write something to the memory. So some questions, um, a question that I sometimes get in the class, and because we didn't ask, I'm gonna ask you, is that why do we use two signals, memory read and memory write? Why don't we use just one signal? And if it's zero, it reads from the memory, it's one, it writes to the memory. Sometimes I get this question in the class, so do you know the answer for that? Why don't we use just a single signal? When it's zero, we write to the memory. When it's one, we read from the memory. That's correct, Regina. Yes, yeah, so we might not want to do either of those. Okay, so if it's a, let's say we want to add. We don't want to do anything with the memory, data memory anyway, so we don't want to write anything to the memory or read anything from it. And that's why we have to use two signals to do this. One signal would be enough. And now we have the last signal is a mem2 reg. If it's zero, just follow this path. This is zero is connected to the output of the ALU. So if it's zero, it means that the value that they want to write to the register, this is coming from here. The value that they want to write to the register is coming from the ALU. And if it is one, the content that we want to write to the register file is coming from memory. This path. Okay, here I have to show you something because you might have confused. So this is slide actually looks like this. You have to actually play the animation to be able to see the content here. Okay, so if you download it, it's not a, this is not the problem. It's just run the animation, you can see it, or just get rid of these guys. So, so now let's see what it looks like. We have, this is all the signals that we have here. We don't have a PC source and we already know it. We 
don't need to ask you why because we talked about it. We have a branch signal and a zero signal. This generates the PC source. The PC source is not directly generated, but in a processor, in pretty much all of every processor that we have, there's a control unit that controls the flow, the flow of data. So sometimes uh, there are some research on data flow architecture and these kind of things, and they have uh, they focus on control units pretty much, but this is a very simple one. When you design, for example, TPUs, tensor processing units, data flow becomes way more complex, so you have to reorganize and do some scheduling as well. But this is what control unit does. It controls the, the flow of the data, input to output, okay, depending on the instruction that we have. The signals that we generate are register destinations, branch, memory read, memory mem to reg, AOUOP, which is two bits, that's why it's a little bit thicker, it's two bits. And we have memory write, ALU source, and register write. How do we define these signals? Just based on the opcode. That's the next thing that we use. If the instruction, the bits 31 to 26, that was the first rule. Opcode is always in bits 31 to 26. Based on the opcode, we can define all these signals. We just read the six bits and we generate those six signals. So I can ask you in the exam that I want to run this instruction. I can actually come up with an instruction which is not even in MIPS. I just explain what this instruction does. We are basically enhancing this instruction set architecture. So I can enhance the instruction set architecture and I give you a new instruction, I explain how it works, and I give you the data path. And then you generate the control signals for that new instruction that you haven't seen before. Okay. So now we have nine control signals, seven for, uh, we actually have eight signals here, but ALUOP has two bits, so we need nine bits to control this processor. Okay. Everything is based on the six bit now, let's practice this and see how the signals work. Okay. So the way I usually do this, I, I ask some questions for you and I want you to answer those questions. And these are the questions that you have to ask yourself when you want to find the control signal. So that's the thing that I want you guys to do learn from this practice. We're going to have three different instructions. We do it together. Just pay attention to the question that I ask. Because when I ask these questions, it's very easy for you to answer it, right? But if I'm not there to answer this question, you should ask these questions from yourself, okay? So now let's see. We have an instruction like this. Add T2 and T3 and put the result in T1, okay? And we want to see what the control signal should be. Right, let's start with the first one, register destination. So register destination, I come here and find it, and I go track the line, and it goes to this multiplexer. So now, the question that we need to ask, for this instruction, the register that we want to write to, the address for the register that we want to write the result into, is coming from instruction 15 to 11, bits 15 to 11, or bits 20 to 16? And the question is, which one of these paths we need to choose to find the address for the destination register? So this should be the second path, this R type, right? This is an R type, it should be the second path. So the register destination should be 0, 1, 1. ALU source. So let's find the ALU source here. The ALU source is here, going to this multiplexer. The question is, the second input for the ALU is coming from the register file or the sign extended offset field. The second input for the ALU, is it coming from the register file based on this instruction or the sign extended offset field? coming from the register file. So ALU source should be zero. zero. 
The next one is mem2 reg. Let's find the mem2 reg. This goes to this multiplexer. So this multiplexer is either sending the output of the data memory to the register file or the output of the ALU to the register file. Okay. So now for this instruction, are we sending the output of the memory to the register file or the output of the ALU to the register file? ALU. So the multiplexer should be Register write. For this instruction, are we writing anything to the register file? Yes. Yes. So register write would be one. Am I reading anything from the memory? This is the memory read, right? Am I reading anything from the memory of this instruction? No. So it's going to be zero. Am I writing anything to the memory? Zero. Is it a branch instruction? No, zero. What is the ALU OP? I don't remember that. So I go back, to, you don't have to remember that. This is OP was worse. I go back to here. I have the add the operation. And ALU OP is one zero. Okay. So if I come back here, ALU OP one, which has been formed to be one, ALU OP zero would be zero. Does that make sense? It's the ALU. Is it always one zero for R types? Yes. Okay. Like a load word. Register destination is coming from here. So we're basically choosing the address for the register that we want to write to. Is it coming from bits 20 to 16 or bits 15 to 11? to 16. So register destination should be zero. zero. ALU source, <coughs> okay, that's a little bit, <coughs> not a little bit tricky, it's actually it's straightforward. ALU source is the second output of input of the ALU coming from the register file or is coming from the sign extended offset field? It's coming from the sign extended offset field. We only have an offset here. So it's going to be sign extended. So what does it mean? ALU source should be 0, 1. Should be 1. Mem2 reg. Let's go and find the mem2 reg. The content that I want to write to the register, is it coming from the memory or is it coming from the output of the ALU? It's coming from the memory, right? It's a load port. So load port, it means that I want to load something from the memory and write it to the register. So this is coming from the memory, which means the multiplexer should be input should be one. Register write. Am I writing something to the register here? Yes. So it's one. Am I reading anything from the memory here? Yes. One. So Xander is the only one who knows the answers. You guys actually can contribute if you want to. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's my way of knowing if you understand it or not. So now I'm confident that you know it, and Xander knows it, and that's pretty much it. Everyone else is just looking at me. Okay? So stop smiling and contribute. <laughs> but am I writing something to the memory? No. Now you guys don't know it either. Okay. Good. It's just me. Am I writing something to the memory? No. 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 So it means that it's going to be zero. Is it a branch instruction? No, thank you. Zero. ALU OP would be, again, don't, uh, don't know it, but it's zero, zero if you go back to the table. Okay? Store board. It's your chance to shine. So, register destination is coming from here. So, it's store board. What does it mean? Store board means that I want to get something from the register file. I write it to the memory, to the data memory, right? Something, I calculate the address, get it from the register file. T1 is coming from the register file, and I store it in this memory address, right? Okay, so now let's start with the register destination. The question is, is the input, is the address for the register that I want to write to 
coming from bits 20 to 16 or it's coming from bits 15 to 11. What was that? Could you lie to the memory so we don't need this? Okay. Yes, okay. So we don't write anything to the register file, right? So we don't need this address. When we don't need this address, do we know what you put here instead of zero one? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. This is literally called don't care in the digital logic. So we have bits zero have one and don't care. So this is don't care bit. I don't care what it is. Okay. So ALU source. ALU source have followed here. The second input of the ALU is it coming from the sign extended offset or it's coming from the register file? It's coming from the offset, the sign extended offset, which means the AO source would be one. Mem2 reg. Mem2 reg is here. Is the content of the value that I want to write back to the register file coming from memory or is it coming from the ALU? ALU. ALU? And you say memory, right? We have two answers, ALU and memory. Who thinks it doesn't matter, right? So, louder, right? Okay. Yeah, that was a correct answer. So we don't care, we're not writing anything back to the memory, right? The register, right. Am I writing anything to the register? Do we care about this one? So we don't care about this one, right? No, we actually do care about this one. Right? Because we are not writing anything to the register file, right? So we do care about it. It's zero. Don't write anything to the register file. Right? So memory read. Am I reading anything from the memory? No. 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 Do we care about it? Yes. Yes, we do care about it. We don't want to read anything. Am I right? Am I writing anything to the memory? Yes. One. Is it a branch? No. OP. I don't know it, but that table, I believe in that table. So it's zero, zero. Go and check it. Okay. The last one. <clears throat> branch equal. So register destination. Branch equal, we compare these two registers and jump to a label. That's how the instruction works. So AO register destination is the first one. It's the address of the register that I want to write to, coming from bits 20 to 16 or bits 15 to 11. We don't care. Okay. ALU source is the second input of the ALU coming from the register file or it's coming from the sign extended offset. So it should be one. Okay. See that <laughs> So what do we do in branch? We actually do subtraction, right? We get two registers, we subtract them. So both of the registers are coming from the register. But don't make that mistake, because I don't lose any points, but you do. So, <laughs> so we read two registers from the register file, both of them. I go source should be zero. Mem2 reg is the content of the register that we want to, the value that we want to write back to the register file. Is it coming from the memory or is it coming from the ALU? don't care, right? Because we're not writing anything back to the register file. We're just comparing two registers and jumping to an address, so we don't care. Register write. Am I writing anything to the register file? No. Zero. Am I reading anything from the memory? No. You're back in silent mode, so zero. Am I writing anything to the memory? Is it a branch? Yes. Yes. What is ALU OP for the branch? It's zero one. Okay. Okay. Last thing we want to cover. So now you know how to work with the signals. If I give you a new instruction that you haven't seen, it's not in this instruction set architecture. You know how to do it, right? If I ask to give me the control signal for add immediate, even if it's not in those signals, you should be able to let me know what that is. Okay. So jump. That's the last thing we cover, and then we're gonna have a kahoot and we're done. Um, how do we implement the jump? We have 26 bits 
This is this is something I think we talked about before. We get the machine code. The op code is, has the same six bits, and then we have 26 bits for the address. Okay. So what we do, we get this 26 bit. We concatenate it. We actually shift it left twice, or multiply it by four, and then we concatenate this 28 bits with the four bit of PC. Okay. We talked about it before. We know how it works. This is just a reminder. Okay. So now, if I want to create a data path that also supports jump, this is one example. So I'm providing this example to you because this is the kind of question that I could have asked you. So, so far, when we said it's a simple data path, we didn't have jump as a part of that data path, right? When we mentioned instructions, we had branch equal, but we didn't have jump. Now, I'm asking this question from you in the exam. I want to have, I want to support jump, and I give you the data path, and I want you to draw the blocks that needs to be added to support these instructions as well. Okay. So now, how does it work? This is this is what you need to add. We get the jump. This is PC plus four. So jump works with the target with PC as well. Branch jump, they both deal with PC, they change the program counter. That's everything they do, okay? So we, we have one, we, have, we already know what this is. This is for calculating the branch target address. We have a multiplexer that here that chooses between PC plus four and the branch target address, okay? But now what we need to do is, based on what we have here, we get the 26 bit, we shift it left twice and concatenate it with the most significant four bits of the PC. So instruction 0 to 25 is coming here. We shift it left twice. And here we con this is the concatenation. You know, they're going together. We concatenate it with PC, the four bits of the PC plus four. Okay. So PC is usually a very, it's not a very, we can't really have too many instructions. So it doesn't really matter if you use the, that's why it's designed this way in the data path. It doesn't really matter if you use the four bits of the PC or the four bits of the PC plus four. Because the most significant four bits are so big that probably you're never gonna get to that point with your code. And even if you get, you're gonna get an error. If you have a, like a super, like these weird errors that you get sometimes in your code, I, I, I really doubt that any of you had this problem before because you should have a really large code, like really large code. If you have that, you start getting weird errors in your processor that you can't even fix. These are the problems, you just need to use another processor, right? It means that you're pushing the boundaries of the hardware for your application. So we do research on edge computing and every day we get to this problem. Now I have a student who is working on small devices and when they want to run really large machine learning models on those really small devices, we get really weird errors you know, because we actually push the boundaries of hardware. Okay, but I don't believe that any of you, I don't want to judge you, but I think like at this point of the education, probably you never got to a point that you were really pushing, on the, you know, unless you're working in a research team that is doing research on these areas. If you push the boundaries of hardware to a point that you can actually deploy a workload on it. But if you do, then you're gonna have a problem. Because it usually doesn't have any doesn't happen in MIPS processor, what they have done here is instead of adding PC, the four bits of PC, they can concatenate the four bits of PC plus four because it just happens in another step. The decoding happens here. They do this part in another we talk about it next session when we talk about pipelining. Next session, I mean two weeks from now, when we talk about instruction level parallelism and pipelining, you can see that we have five a stage. They do these computations in different stages. So the PC plus four is done in the fetch. The calculation for jump is done in the decoding phase. Okay. So we, we, in, in, uh, we concatenate the four most significant bits of the PC with the instruction zero to instruction bits zero to twenty-five that are shifted twice to get the jump address. Now this goes to a multiplexer as you can see here. So we calculate the jump target address, we calculate the branch target address, and we have PC plus four. We have two multiplexers, or we could have had a, a 
four by one multiplexer. So that could have been done too, three by one multiplexer. But here, instead of using that, they use two different multiplexers. So the first multiplexer chooses between PC plus four, which is the next instruction, and the branch target address. The next multiplexer chooses between the jump target address and whatever is coming out of this multiplexer, right? And then we have, we have to add a signal that is called jump to choose, if it's a jump instruction based on the opcode, it's going to activate this path. So now if you want to go to your next instruction, to PC plus 4, you should have this multiplexer set to 0 and this multiplexer set to 0 as well. If you want to go to the branch target address, you have to have this multiplexer set to 1 and this multiplexer to set to 0. If you want to jump, you don't care about what is happening here, and you just choose one. Does that make sense? Okay, so that was it. We have a good idea about a very basic MIPS processor and how it works. The next module is going to be a little bit more advanced topics. This is, this is called a single cycle processor. Okay, so the entire computation happens in one clock cycle. Okay, it's a little bit weird, but it does happen in one clock cycle. It's called combinational circuit. So you apply the inputs, this five stage happens in one clock, and then you read the output, but your clock should be pretty long to give it enough time to do the entire computation. Next module, we talk about multi-cycle processors that, that have pipelining and then you can have like five instructions that run five instructions at the same time and so on. So this module is done. Let's do the oh, go ahead. So how do you find the ALU off of like an instruction that we're not given in the slides? How do you so you can assume that if it's for example so this load board and store board and these are I type instructions, right? right? So you can think of it as I type instructions. Okay. And so they should be instructions. similar based on their type. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but that's that's a really good question. So ALU office should be something that I provide to you uh, because when you have a branch, for example, load word and store word is different from branch, but yeah. all of them are I type, right? Yeah. So what I just said is not very accurate either. Uh, but um, yeah, if I ask that question, probably I'd be careful to either give you the ALU op or don't ask about the ALU op. Okay. okay. But that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay, so.